This video was brought to you by Native. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So imagine if somebody was hosting the biggest, fanciest party in the world, and all of the leaders of all of the different countries were the guests. I don't know what the occasion would be. Maybe someone was being crowned Emperor of Earth, or some alien had landed and wanted to meet the top representatives of all of the nations of our planet. But in any case, in a situation like that, all of the world leaders would surely want to wear their nicest, fanciest, most ceremonial outfits possible. And it turns out that a lot of world leaders do indeed have a special outfit for just such occasions. And that is what we will be talking about today, the exciting world of ceremonial clothes for government people. I often feel like these days we are getting closer and closer to a world in which all of our politicians just wear normal, casual clothes all of the time. Certainly when you see politicians out and about mingling with the public, they tend to be dressed increasingly informally. Presumably this is because this is what the public wants, politicians who are just like us. But back in the Victorian age, when a lot of our political traditions were being dreamt up, the dominant thinking was that politicians should not be just like us at all. Politicians, the thinking went, were rulers, and rulers should carry themselves in a way that is far more impressive than the common rabble. Politics was something gentlemanly and sophisticated, and therefore politicians should be fashionable people who followed dress codes and other traditions relating to style and clothing. And it was during this time that a lot of rules regarding what political leaders should wear in various official contexts were all standardized. And a lot of these rules are still more or less in place today, even if they are now only ever obeyed on the most ceremonial of occasions. So in the United States of America, for a long time this was considered the most formal official thing a politician could wear. If you've ever seen the movie Spaceballs, this is what the president character wears in that. It is sometimes called morning dress or a morning suit. It consists of a special sort of jacket that's very long in the back, a light vest, a shirt with an abnormally narrow collar, striped pants, and this very particular sort of silk necktie known as an ascot cravat which is really more like a scarf that's been pinned in place. And of course, a top hat. At one time, this is what most American politicians would wear on any sort of official occasion, bashing the champagne bottle on the side of the boat or handing out the blue ribbon for the best cherry pie at the county fair. It is from this outfit's association with these sorts of rituals that we get the cartoon cliche of the mayor who is wearing very outlandish and old fashioned clothes. In the old days, the stereotype was that mayors didn't really have any purpose beyond doing these sort of dopey ceremonies. Beginning in the mid 19th century, Every single president of the United States wore a morning suit when he was sworn into office, right up until John F. Kennedy, top hat and all. But Kennedy's successor as president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, did not wear the morning suit at his inauguration and Neither has any president since. Well, except for Ronald Reagan. Good conservative that he is, he brought back the morning suit for his first inauguration in 1981. When Donald Trump was elected, I thought he might maybe bring it back because of his well-known love of razzle-dazzle, but he did not. But this doesn't mean that the morning suit is completely absent from American politics. In some of the older states, the governor still wears it to his inauguration, like in Virginia, and, well, actually, I think Virginia might be the only one that still does it. Though I know that Missouri used to do it up until relatively recently as well. Lawyers representing the US federal government used to have to wear the morning suit when they were arguing cases in front of the Supreme Court. As you can see in this scene from the movie Bridge of Spies, where Tom Hanks is playing a lawyer for the CIA. But then Obama got rid of this tradition in 2009. One of his ostensible reasons for doing so was that he had just appointed the first ever female solicitor general of the United States, a woman named Elena Kagan, who you might've heard of. And the problem was that there was no real female equivalent to this sort of outfit. I mean, I guess since the morning suit is based on Victorian formal wear, the female equivalent would be like a full-length ball gown. And this actually gets at one of the big reasons why it is so hard to maintain these clothing traditions in modern times. All of our ceremonial outfits tend to have been exclusively designed with 
men in mind. Official outfits are almost always men's clothes, because of course back in the day no one could conceptualize the possibility that someday a woman would hold such an important government job. But then women did, and so the new dilemma became, should we force women to wear men's clothes, or should we invent some sort of new anachronistic outfit just for women? Or should we just ditch these traditions altogether? And in most cases, we just ditch the traditions altogether. Another good example of this would be the Speaker of the British House of Commons. He used to always wear one of those wigs until 1994, in which a woman was elected Speaker. And she went wigless, and so have all of the Speakers since. Outside of America, the morning dress tradition survives in some other countries. In Japan, for instance, their politicians are still very into upholding all of the Victorian traditions that they inherited during their mid-19th century phase of westernization. Their prime minister and emperor still wears a morning suit on all sorts of official occasions, like when new cabinet ministers are sworn in, or when the emperor gives his yearly speech to the parliament, or sometimes for ceremonies involving the military. Did you see how he was still holding his top hat there? The final big realm where you still sometimes see this outfit is for certain traditions involving diplomats or ambassadors. In fact, you may have even heard the expression striped pants diplomacy before, which refers to this idea of diplomats being too uptight and formal. So there is this very ancient tradition that says that the very first thing an ambassador should do when he arrives in a foreign country is meet the ruler of that country and give him a letter from his country's king or president or whatever. Given how many countries there are these days, I have often felt like world leaders must waste an awful lot of time on this tradition, but they all still do it. And in some countries, there is this whole other added layer of tradition that says that when the ambassador meets the ruler, he should wear some sort of ceremonial costume that is native to his country. So for example, here we see the German president meeting the ambassador from Lesotho. But since a lot of countries don't really have a distinct ceremonial costume in their culture, they often just default to the morning suit. So here we see the American ambassador giving his letter to Queen Elizabeth, and here is the Dutch ambassador after he's given his letter to the governor of the Bahamas. I like this photo of the full Afghan diplomatic delegation to Japan on the day that they were meeting with the emperor. And speaking of royalty, the other super duper formal ceremonial dress up -y event in the life of a political leader is of course the state dinner. This is when one head of state hosts a lavish dinner party for another, which is considered one of the most intimate and important gestures of friendship between nations. They only happen rarely, and usually within a rather tight group of allied countries. And because they are such a big deal, state dinners also have their own unique weird dress code that you don't really see anywhere else these days. White tie. White tie refers to a special sort of tuxedo oh. that is extremely rare and basically only ever worn by super elite political leaders at super elite political ceremonies. You can see President Trump wearing a white tie tuxedo here at his 2019 state dinner with the Queen in London. But what is the most interesting part of the white tie dress code is that world leaders are also supposed to wear their official decorations. And this is where things really start to get glitzy. But before we get to that, let us just talk quickly about today's video sponsor, Native. Now, when you are going to some fancy state dinner for some king or something, the last thing you want to do is smell bad, right? Well, that is why you need Native brand deodorant. Now, when the Native people first reached out to me, I was like, I don't know, deodorant, really? But then my friend was like, dude, JJ, Native is a really highly rated brand. And indeed they are. For example, you can see them here on this Esquire list of all of the best deodorants under the subhead Aluminium Free. And it is true, Native deodorant do not contain any aluminium, nor do they contain any sulfates, parabens, or animal products. Hence why they call it native. The only ingredients are natural things like coconut oil and shea butter. This gives it that nice dry texture as you can see. As far as scents go, I have just been going with this unscented one because I am boring. But if you are on the more adventurous side, they do have a lot of fun flavors as well, like charcoal or cucumber mint. I do really like smelling them. Anyway, the special deal that they are giving you guys is that if you click on the link in the thing below, you can get three sticks just like this for only $24. That is a 33% discount from the regular price, and you get free shipping if you live in any one of these fine countries. So a very good deal on a product that 
everybody needs. Anyway, so yes, official decorations. So if you've ever seen a picture of a bunch of royal people wearing white tie tuxedos, you have probably noticed that they tend to accessorize with a colored sash and a lot of medals. These are what they call decorations, and it is not just royal people that have them. For example, here is the Italian president at a state dinner for the Queen of Sweden. Here is the president of Slovenia meeting the King of Norway. Here is President Zuma of South Africa with Queen Elizabeth again. So the way it works is that most countries have some sort of grand national award usually referred to as the nation's highest honor. And usually the president or king or whatever is in charge of deciding who gets it, and he usually gets a special version of it for himself as well. In most countries, the physical version of the award consists of a colored sash and a brooch, but it can sometimes be a medal or a chain or something you wear around your neck as well. Here in Canada, for example, the governor general is in charge of something called the Order of Canada, and at white tie events, he always wears his Order of Canada thing around his neck. The President of France, meanwhile, is the head of the Legion of Honor, which has all of these accessories associated with it. The Portuguese president gets to wear this tricolored sash and this three-headed medal in acknowledgement of the fact that he is head of the three different orders of Portuguese chivalry, one of which is called the Order of Christ. Could you imagine if the American president was head of something called the Order of Christ? This whole tradition, by the way, is why so many stereotypical depictions of vampires always have a medal or a sash. Since the original Dracula was supposed to be Count of Transylvania, who always ran around wearing a white tie tuxedo, it logically follows that he would be wearing decorations to signify that he was head of the Transylvanian order of bloodsuckers or whatever. What makes this tradition a bit more complicated, however, is that there is this whole other tradition of world leaders giving decorations to each other and then wearing those decorations when they meet. It is sort of like how you will ostentatiously wear the sweater that grandma gave you for Christmas the next time you see her. So for example, here we see the French president Nicolas Sarkozy hosting a state dinner for the King of Spain, and the King is wearing his French decorations while Sarkozy is wearing his Spanish ones. Here is a rare photo of an American president doing this. This is President Eisenhower wearing the British Order of Merit that he won after World War II at a state dinner for Queen Elizabeth at the White House in 1957. I don't think any American president has done this since then, just because I think that in American culture, it would be considered kind of weirdly militaristic for the president to be wearing medals in public. Although, and here is a weird story, the former dictator of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos, once commissioned this big garish portrait of Ronald Reagan wearing the Filipino Medal of Valor. As far as I know, Reagan never actually did this in real life. Okay, so in most cases, I would consider either white tie or a morning suit to be the closest thing that most world leaders have to an official uniform. But for some heads of state, they literally have an official uniform. Obviously, over the years, there have been a lot of world leaders who were army officers, who used the power of the military to take control of the government and put themselves in charge. And such people, as a general rule, justified seizing power on the grounds that military people are just inherently better than civilians, so they would accordingly wear their military uniforms all the time while doing government stuff. And then on more ceremonial occasions, military rulers would wear these absurdly over-the-top uniforms with a truly preposterous number of medals. I remember reading once that the infamous military dictator of Uganda Idi Amin had to put a sheet of wood in his jacket because otherwise the weight of all the medals would tear it. But these days, I think this whole business of world leaders wearing military uniforms strikes most people as a little bit fascistic, so it's not really done anymore. The military leader of Egypt, for instance, President Sisi, has basically never worn his military uniform since taking power. Kings and queens still do, however. Most royal people are expected to do some military service as part of their upbringing, and for some reason, they then proceed to wear those uniforms in public for the rest of their lives, especially at formal events like weddings or being on a balcony. But in some countries, there is also something known as the civil uniform, which is a ceremonial uniform for non-military people. This is a very common tradition in Asian countries, I notice. In Thailand, for instance, the president and her cabinet all have these nice white uniforms they wear on 
official occasions. Same with the Prime Minister of Malaysia and the leader of Indonesia. The Indonesian guy seems to have a lot of fun looks, in fact. There was a time in which everybody high up in the government of China wore the famous Mao jacket, which was once supposed to be basically the civil uniform for everyone in the country. But these days, the Chinese leadership just wears normal Western-style business suits, and they only wear the Mao jacket on special ceremonial occasions. So you can see President Xi wearing his Mao jacket at this dinner with the King of Spain. But would you believe that there is an official uniform for the Prime Minister of Canada? It's true, and it looks like this. This is what they used to call the Windsor uniform, and during the Victorian age, it was the standard ceremonial uniform for high-ranking people in the British Empire, including colonial governors and prime ministers. As far as I know, the last Canadian prime minister to actually wear it was William Lyon Mackenzie King, who was prime minister for about a quarter of the 20th century, and the subject of a very good video I made that you should really watch when you have a chance. Anyway, you can see him wearing the uniform here as he visits the White House to meet with President Roosevelt. But then prime ministers just stopped wearing it and instead they would wear a morning suit at ceremonial events like the speech from the throne. But then Stephen Harper put an end to that tradition when he became prime minister in 2006. I feel like he was not the sort of guy that had much time for fanciness. The Windsor uniform is still worn, however, by some of the lieutenant governors of Canada. These are extremely obscure officers of the provincial governments who basically only exist to do ceremonial junk. So this whole business of ceremonial clothes for politicians wound up being a far deeper rabbit hole than I expected. I mean, I didn't even have time to get to the flag sashes the presidents wear in South America, or some of the fun ceremonial clothes they have in Africa. If you have some good examples of ceremonial clothes, let me know in the thing below. Don't forget about the deal from Native, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>